So I never really thought much about health. Um, I'd always had problems with my colon, but about a couple of years ago, I had a colonoscopy, and there was some inflammation in a part of my colon. Didn't know much about it. So I did an MRI about three years ago, and uh, you, know, you get a paragraph to the doctor that says, well, a part of your sigmoid colon is 15 millimeters thick instead of three, uh, but that was about it. So I said, well, why don't you give me the data? And so they cut me a CD. I went back to Cal 82, my institute at UC San Diego. We put it up into our uh, wall that's about three times bigger than the one here in the hive uh, and put it into 3D software. Uh, and sure enough, I found out that uh, my, this six inches or so was uh, inflamed. Now, this is the way normally you look at this, uh, doctors look at this in slice mode, but by applying software to the data, as we just heard, you can make it organ-centric. And so I do this all the time in our virtual reality cave, except in full stereo, so I can I basically turn my insides into a video game and can kind of fly through it. Uh, and what you can see here is uh, this, the red part there, that's the inflamed part with that little funny uh, wiggle and that's where the descending colon goes across the sigmoid. But because we're uh, living in the world we are, I can make a 3D copy of it. And this 3D copy uh, is actually life-size. And, and, and this is the part that actually has the inflammation uh, in it. Um, and, and so, you know, actually having, holding your colon in the hand is power. Um, <laughs> so I... I, but I then wondered, well, what is the source of inflammation? And um, now I'm a little obsessive, so I've been taking blood tests for the last five years, about every two months, as well as stool tests, about 50 blood tests and about 40 stool tests. And then these are the graphs of 150 variables that I track inside my body uh, that I can look across. And as I look across all those graphs over the last five or 10 years, there was only one of them that was actually far out of norm. Uh, something called CRP, complex reactive protein. Now, I'm a physicist, astrophysicist, computer scientist. I didn't know CRP from anything, but fortunately, you can go into PubMed, and I've read hundreds of articles, uh, research literature, and it turns out that this is a generic measure of inflammation. It should be less than one. It was climbing up to 30 times normal limits. So that didn't sound so good. So then I looked into the stool, and stool is this wonderful window that is completely ignored. It's the most information-rich medium you've ever laid eyes on. Uh, half of it is, is microbes, about a billion per cubic centimeter, and each of them are about 10 million bases of DNA. So this is an incredible amount of information that we're going to be able to learn about. And as you look at it, one of the things in there you can find is a protein called lactoferrin. Turns out what that is is shed from the surface of killer white blood cells when they're infiltrating the walls of your colon and actually causing them to thicken. Now, um, this was not the doctor doing this. Uh, I couldn't get the doctor interested in stool tests. Um, but you just go on the web, get a kit out, you know, take your sample, put it in FedEx, and um, a week or two later, there it is on the web. And um, when you, each of those dots is a, is a test, and you can see it was 125 times normal, about 900 in its, in its units, rather than less than seven. Now, that's kind of freaky, right? So I looked into the scientific literature, I said, what is this lactoferrin, is there any relationship to any known disease? Well, here are these bars that show you that I was down normally around 200 and then up to, to 900, and the only thing that uh, that can be is a chronic incurable disease, an autoimmune disease called inflammatory bowel disease, which comes in two flavors, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Um, and so I knew that, but when I told the doctor, done my colonoscopy, he said, well, I don't think you've got it because I've been inside your colon and I, I didn't see any. I said, yeah, but like, this is the scientific literature, right? This is science, not medicine. Anyway. Uh, that didn't go too well, so uh, I got a new doctor. Um, I go through a lot of doctors. Um, I mean, if you think coming in with a pile of printouts from the web is an informed patient, I'm like the doctor's worst nightmare. Yeah, and um, so, but it's, uh, it's changing very much for the better, and 
what this allows me to do is I've now added the CRP, the lactoferrin, and two other point, the lysozyme, which is your innate immune system, a, a measure of it, and secretory IgA, your most common antibody that is in your adaptive immune system. And, and if you normalize those curves and lay them on top of each other, you all of a sudden see this envelope of what I had been feeling in terms of symptoms, which are, uh, I kept track every day of what the symptoms were and then organized them by week, and each of those bars is a week wide, and it's like zero to five is the color. I'm just making this all up. But I mean, actually, no, <laughs> I did this and worked with my team at Cal IT2 to do this. And what you can see is, the amazing thing is that these are measuring out components of your immune system, but they're not at all in phase with each other. They're in some sort of odd dance, and each one is doing something different, like the lysozyme is attacking gram-positive bacteria, the uh, neutrophils are, are taking away iron from the bacteria. So then I did these three uh, samples of stool, which we then analyzed, uh, and I'll show you the results in just a minute, using genomic sequencing. Now, the reason that, that the immune system is dancing with your microbes is that you have 10 times as many microbes cells as your human cells in your body, but more importantly, you have 100 times as many genes in the DNA of the microbes as are in your human DNA. Um, and so what, and that's not been included in medicine. So the inclusion of that is going to radically change. I mean, think that we're doing medicine with 1% of the actual information that's being generated inside of you by the uh, organisms. Again, I have this 64 million pixel wall, so I can look at this kind of complexity. So basically, I sent the, my stool off to the Craig Venner Institute. It got sequenced, sent back to me. I used about 25 CPU years on computers, supercomputers, to analyze it and compare it with um, about uh, 35 healthy people that I pulled down from the NIH Human Microbiome Program. And then I can line them up and compare them and look at the changes over time. Every four months, I did these samples, or compared to the population. And here's this shocking thing I found out. Now, don't worry about the names of these critters. Nobody knows what they do anyway. Um, uh, because actually about 85% of the microbes can't be cultured, and so we really literally don't know what their properties are, even though we know their complete genomic uh, code. Because we, 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 the way we did the mathematics is we pulled down about 2,500 full genomes of microbes and viruses and so forth. But the red bars are the percentage, like 4%, 3%, of the most common uh, microbes in across, say, 35 healthy people, and the blue bars are mine. And so I've just had all of the good bacteria wiped out. And by the way, I feel fine. I don't intuit this very well, and neither would you. It's, it's this fallacy that somehow you can guess what's going on inside of you instead of measuring it. Anyway, what are my common ones? Well, there they are, and, and you don't care what they are either, except that look at the numbers above them. That's the number times the amount in a healthy person. So I've got like 765 times, 148 times. So why? Because when the good bacteria were wiped out, all these rarer ones could then take over the neighborhood. And this is how ecology works. You are an ecology. So. Um, now, I'm going to take you into a little, just a little bit of what we know about the, the large-scale biological structure of these things, the phyla. But I, I have to first of all say that I think we underestimate just how incredibly rich the biological uh, activity is inside of you. So here are some animals that you're familiar with, and you'd think normally gorillas and fish are pretty different, right? But they're all animals with backbones called vertebra, and they're just a, actually a subphylum. The phylum, the biggest groups of life, are, uh, are called chordata. Now, we're going to look at six uh, phyla of, of microbes. So imagine the tiger representing all vertebra on Earth, and then the um, butterfly is like a million insects, and all the mollusks and the earthworms and, and so forth. Each of these, by how different they are in terms of body planning and everything else, are a separate phyla. But well, when you look at the microbes, here uh, is a pie chart, and there are those six uh, colors, are each uh, phyla of microbes that are inside of you. Uh, and you can see that in a healthy person, the blue, the bacteriodes, are, are the common ones, and the rest are pretty much firmicutes, and everything else is a little wedge. But if you look at the two forms of IBD, you can see 
on Crohn's that the, the blue are just wiped out. There, there's a collapse of the bacteriotes, and there's an explosion in ulcerative colitis of proteobacteria. By the way, that's like E. coli, okay? That's the most famous guy in proteobacteria. Well, what about me? Well, there I am. So, um, quick, what do I have? Well, sort of like Crohn's. Mmm, a little bit of green. Might be more like ulcerative colitis. And it turns out that there's very few humans who have had this level of, of, of depth of analysis, and so there were like five people. <laughs> oh, that, that was a surprise. Uh, so there are only five people out there that, that, are, that are done this uh, in this detail in Crohn's, and they have ileal Crohn's, which is the small intestine, whereas I'm over here, I'm on the colonic side. That's a different disease subtype, I believe, from the quantification of this. Um, now, when you read in the literature, they say that this is um, IBD, you have a dysbiosis of your microbiome. Does that sound like very drastic? It's a little off, right? Well, let's see, 90% of the bacteriotes are gone. Remember the big comet that hit the Earth and wiped out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago? What percent of the vertebrae do you think as a phyla or a subphyla were wiped out? 20%. This is 90%. I wouldn't call this a dysbiosis. I would call this a mass extinction. What I did then is I had these four times, and I was able to go through and compare myself, now having compared myself with the population, then use myself as my own norm, and actually uh, compare at three different times. So what I did is I could then, um, what um, my doctor, Bill Sanborn, who's one of the top clinical researchers in the country, uh, at, uh, his head of GI at UCSD, said, okay, we're going to do some therapy. So about a year ago, I went for a month on uh, Cipro and Flagyl antibiotics and uh, two months of prednisone, which is an uh, immunosuppressant. And uh, the question is, what happens? You know, when a doctor tells you I'm going to give you antibiotics, does he or she go in and measure who is there in detail and then say, oh, I see what you got. We're going to specify this particular uh, antibiotic uh, or, and then afterwards come back and measure it again? No, they don't, but they will. And, um, and so what you can see is here are my three times, and uh, I won't go into a lot of detail, but those orange ones, uh, are methanogens. They're a whole different um, kingdom of, of bacteria, normally not found in humans. Um, after the bacteria between the first and the second circle, they were reduced 45 times, and the fusobacteria, which you may remember reading about in the New York Times last year, has been found in colon cancer samples. I had a lot, um, and thankfully they're uh, 90 times lower. So. Um, this is uh, enabling you now to track across time. So you can see is that um, this massive reduction, while we got rid of some of the bad things, the, the massive reduction in the bacteria deeds remains, and the large population of the proteobacteria remain. Uh, and then the next one you can see, which is four months later, is pretty much the same. It's pretty stable. So, what this allows us to do, if we start thinking about this, is tracking this amazing amount of life that's inside you over time and relative to the therapy uh, that um, is applied. And that's going to be a very different form of uh, medicine than, than what we're used to. So where is this leave us? Um, you know, I now know what my state is. I know that I'm a long way from home, that is, from a healthy microbiome. That's information I didn't have. And I have to say, it's very empowering to have that knowledge, because while I don't know how to get back home, I know where home is. And in, while this is, seems like an enormously complex task to do with supercomputers and everything else, there are all kinds of startups that are coming in to make keeping track of your microbiome uh, as very simple. And in fact, you're going to hear from Jessica Richmond about Ubiome as just an example of one of those startups. So 
So the startups are basically going to enable us to keep much finer grain time series of this dance. There's other startups that are doing blood variables that graph them just like I'm doing wellness FX, inside tracker. And so we're going to be able to participate ourselves in a way that, that because of the big data and because of the ability to analyze it, we've got hope. Thanks. <laughs>